If you start a sentence with because you, you will always get their attention. If you can lead with, okay, because you are, if another way I say that is if I show you a picture of you or I show a picture and you're in it, you will look at it 100% of the time. And so sales reps typically lead with their solution. It's what they know. Here, let me tell you, let me tell you, we have a solution that does this. And we've tested this. You lead with something about them. They will read it 100% of the time. So it's really, that's part of why reps that are successful, these two X reps, I call them, um, because they're other centered, they know how to lead conversations and how to draw people in by talking about what's on their whiteboard. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I've got Tom Stanfill with me today, and we're going to talk about um, unreceptive, a better way to sell, lead, and influence, uh, a topic he's super familiar with. Um, Tom is CEO and co-founder of Aslam Training, a global sales enablement company appearing nine consecutive years in the Selling Power Top 20. Tom is dedicated to help sellers eliminate buyer resistance and cultivate receptivity. He's featured, he's a featured columnist for CEO World and the author of Unreceptive, A Better Way to Sell, Lead, and Influence. Welcome to the show, Tom. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. I was really excited about joining you. Well, we're, I'm excited to have you here and hear about uh, hear about the book. Um, tell me, uh, why do you think buyers are so resistant to sellers? Oh man, that's that's a great question. I, I think I think uh, sellers are a little bit responsible for that. Uh, you know, I always say that if you, if, if the buyers thought that the only reason you were reaching out was to genuinely help them solve their problem, why wouldn't they welcome a meeting with a seller? Right. And I think that's part of it. I think part of it is we need to own because maybe we have been, uh, you know, our, our, we're, we're not the hero, you know, we're the hero of the story, not the customer. We, we know all about our solution, but we really don't have the expertise to understand their world or solve their problem or lead them to a better solution. So, so those are the things that we need to own. But there's also, there's a, another reason for resistance is the amount of information in the market. I mean, customers are overwhelmed by information. I mean, we're getting 5X the amount of information we got a couple of decades ago. So people are overwhelmed. There's the availability of information. So why do I need to talk to somebody when I can Google anything that I want to out my own time without any pressure? Um, so I, I've got that, that resource. Um, it's also, um, it's also just hard to get people's attention because they're just barraged by information. So I think, I think that's really the driver. I think it's the way that we've sold. And I think what the changes in the market. And I also think it hearts, it's been difficult selling virtually. Right. You know, a lot of the outside sellers and field sellers have had to communicate uh, almost completely virtual. I know that's changing a little bit, but I think that's that's creates a, a receptivity problem because it's harder to get their attention. It's harder. I mean, they're always distracted in meetings. It's, you know, when you walk into a building, people give you more time. You see things, you read body language. There, there's more intimacy created when we're face to face. So there's a lot of factors working against us in sales right now. And that's, by the way, that's not just my opinion. This, I mean, McKinsey did a study recently that, that showed that there was like a decline in customers wanting to talk to a seller when evaluating a solution has, has declined 120% in the last three years. That's astounding. Just in the last three years. Then that's when they're wanting to evaluate, not just talk to a seller about, hey, educate me. Like we're evaluating a solution. The question is, do you want to talk to a seller a sales professional about doing that, <laughs> and 120 percent of of customers say no. Have, have say no. I mean, there's been a decline, not 120 percent, but there's been a decline in the cup willingness of customers that are that are wanting to do that. So, yeah, I mean, that makes a ton of sense to me from, yeah. from what I've seen. Um, and I have a unique perch in the world that I that I view the world yeah. from because I, you know, I see. 5,000 companies and how they are acting and they all have field sales teams and like, and the, the good news that the, the, what do they call that? The silver, the silver lining on that. The is silver that, lining. Uh, they, 
we we really saw a severe decline in uh, in because we can see their act, people's activity in the field, right? We yeah, can gather right. and we can de- look at this data and aggregate across you know the whole economy basically. Um, Interesting. And ma- obviously, massive dip in outside sales activity and during 2020, but it's really back up to um, almost near I think 90 percent of where it was before. Okay. So there there are a few places that that are still impacted and. Uh, but on, on, you know, across across the world, um, things have really popped back open, um, okay. and I guess there's maybe a few countries that's not the case that we do business in. And, but across, you know, in general, it's gotten a lot better. It's got yeah, they're so certain they're not facing. Uh, they're not selling as much virtually as they were. It sounds like it's almost back to normal. That's good to know. Yeah, the I people, wondered about that. I've been we we were trying to predict what the percentage of face-to-face versus virtual would end up being. And a lot of the VPs of sales that we talked to thought it would be like 35% of the time they would sell virtually. And right now, you know, before pre-pandemic, it was about 5% virtually. So they, they predicted post-pandemic, it would be about 35% virtually. I, we, you know, again, these are predictions. I'd be interested to see. But either way, the customer's receptivity to engaging a seller, I think Elva would agree, has, has declined rapidly over the last decade. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and to your other point, I mean, I've I, the five five x the information. It's hard to like, you know, it's just a silly number. But when you actually st- sit st- sit back and think about that, like, what does that mean when you're consuming five x the information? It's, mm-hmm. it's just such a noisy world for our customers. Just, yeah. Well, you think about it, you're getting tech. I mean, just my I think about this all the time. I'm getting text. From, from business people, I'm getting it from, you know, professionals in the business world. I'm getting texts for family, friends, you get email, you got, you got social, like LinkedIn, you've got, I mean, it's just the amount of information out in the market and the number of choices. I mean, I remember, I think I quoted this on a podcast that I did recently, it's like 322 shoes. You know, I got a coupon for that, uh, you know, for shoes. And I go to Nike to try to figure out shoes. And, you know, I was a thousand options when I looked at Nike and Adidas and whoever else I looked at. It's like, it's just, I mean, it's just a lot of options out there. There's just a lot of, a lot of noise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's all about taking shortcuts for the, for consumers now, right? Like yeah. things like wire cutter are so invaluable as a, as a mm-hmm. consumer, um, just cause they, they're great sources of information and you don't have to right. go to six, you don't have to go to six stores. You can just kind of learn about all the options online. And I think that's a shift that we've seen is people are, mm-hmm. when they engage, by the time they engage with a salesperson, they have you know, they didn't just dip their toe in a lot of the time. They've really done some meaningful research and they come in right. relatively educated and they're looking for the salesperson to add some real value. Yes. Yes. They need to know, you know, something they don't know about how to solve their problem. And a lot of sellers don't. So important. Yeah. I mean, they need to, they need to believe, you, you know, something, you have the expertise you're not just somebody that's going to educate me and, and provide a billboard or a PowerPoint presentation on your product. You know something about my world. And I think that's that's ultimately what we want to do is the, the purpose of the book is to solve this receptivity problem. I mean, and here's the issue. When the customer is emotionally unreceptive, which a lot are, I mean, I think it's it's at least 80 plus percentage of customers are close to talking to sellers. When they're emotionally closed, the more you try to sell them, the more closed they become. So sales doesn't work at all. It not only doesn't work, it backfires. And so we still have this traditional mindset when we think about influences, it's we're going to go to court, right? So I'm going to present, I'm going to be persistent. I'm going to keep pinging you with emails. I'm going to be pinging you with messages. I'm going to keep sending these messages. And then I'm going to make my best case. The problem is there's nobody in court. And the more we try to make our logical argument and make our case, the more unreceptive they become. And so we just, what sellers have done is they just ramp up the volume and they have to work harder to find smaller opportunities. And actually, you can. There's a whole uh, uh, large percentage of customers that are that you could potentially win if we knew how to change our approach to selling. And and are you alluding to what you call the drop the rope technique that you talk about in your book? That's where you one of them. Ease yeah. the buyer resistance. Yeah, there's there's five barriers to receptivity that we address in the book. And the first barrier is their perception of you. Right. So they think, you know, really when the customer's like, are they going to buy you before they're ever going to buy your recommendation? And so there's sort of three questions that they ask to determine if they're going to buy you. And one of them is, are you going to pressure me? People don't like pressure. 
They like to feel in control and they always feel like there's a tug of war happening because of our role in sales and because they think we're going to make money off our recommendation that they're, you're going to push your products. You're going to try to, in other words, pull them to your position, and try to get them to do something. You're going to try to make them meet with you, spend more time than you want to. You're going to try to really try to control them and they're going to resist that. So they're, they, they, uh, will respond very positively to what we call drop the rope, which means you end the tug of war. So instead of trying to pull pull the customer to your position and force them to do something they don't want to do, like spend time with them or hear your pitch or try to control what they do or overcome their objection, you do what we call drop the rope. And you say things like, hey, I'm not sure if our service can be a fit for you. <laughs> We're actually um, you know, thinking about getting really close to selling our house. You know, now's the time to downsize real estate markets booming in Atlanta. I'm sure it is everywhere else. And so we're mm -hmm. thinking, hey, let's 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 kind of start looking about selling now. And but where would we go? So so we looked up the this apartment complex, which we haven't done since 1982. <laughs> and so my wife and I are in the car and I call what I think is the apartment complex, but actually it's a it's a it's a leasing service. And they're trying to hide the fact that they're a leasing service. And I didn't call the, the apartment complex that I was calling. And they keep trying to engineer this me working with them versus the apartment complex. And I'm and I'm starting to resist. And, and so this becomes this weird sort of conversation where they're not really answering my questions and they're not really they're hiding what I the information I want so that I can try to, they can try to sell me. And so there's just tug of war going on. And what the lady should have said is, hey, we provide a service that takes hundreds of apartments that you can look at and we simplify that and we represent you. It doesn't cost any money, but I don't know if you need an apartment because if you want to rent a home versus an apartment, we're not a good service for you. We're not the apartment place you called. We represent them along with hundreds of other properties. And our goal is to simplify that process, but you may not need that. If you want a home that you want to rent a home or private residential type of thing, I don't even know the name of it. Um, we're not, we're not for you. I would have just jumped. I would have gone, Hey, no, 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 no. That's what I want. And that would have completely changed the dynamic, but she kept pulling the rope and trying to pull me to her service. And I kept pulling back and it was just this awkward back and forth where I don't trust her. I, I don't want to use her service. Uh, and, and, and funny at the, finally, at the end of it, where she realized her techniques weren't working, she goes, well, I can just give you the plate, the complex. You can call him yourself. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so, so the relationship in, you know, or as simple, simple as like, I walked into Best Buy's look at a television the other day and, and the, the person comes up to me and says, can I help you? And what do I say? No, I'm just looking. I'm just looking. Why do I say that? Because, because I don't want know. some, I don't want some guy pushing the television that they get the spiff of the month on and they get the incentive and Samsung said, sell this television. So they're like, buy this television. And then it's just this awkward, then they follow me around the store and, you know, then they're going to call me or whatever's going to happen after that. So I just rather say, no, I'm fine. And the guy said, Hey, listen, I'm not on commission. If you need help, I'll be over there. I'm happy to help you try to figure out a lot of television, a lot of options, a lot to understand. And uh, I'd love to help you with. So let me know. And he starts to walk away and I grabbed him. Yeah. So, so that's, that's drop the rope. That's eliminating pressure. And, and we can actually do that almost instantly by recognizing the customer has about five options and we really like two of them and we don't like the other three. But if we put all five of the options on the table, which is maybe don't buy from us, maybe only buy partial from us, maybe buy the total solution, maybe delay, whatever it is, if we're willing to put that on the table, they're going to say, this feels very different. I can, I can ask you questions. You're not going to try to trap me. You're not going to try to control me. And the benefit for the rep is control is just an illusion. You have no control. You can get people to fake it, but we have no control. So by, by relinquishing the control we don't even have, we trade that for an opportunity of influence. And we separate ourselves from all these other sellers who are trying to hold on to this, you know, this one customer that we've been able to talk to maybe in the whole day. You know, because I'm sure Jane, who I talked to Friday, she's like, I got one. You know, maybe I could, I got another client, you know, and there's pressure on them to sell. And so they put that pressure on me to buy. So, yeah, well, I mean, that, that's what came to my mind as you were telling that story. You know, yeah. it's, it's tough to use this drop the rope strategy when, when you, you know, you're worried about closing down, closing a deal and your, your boss is breathing down your neck for the, yeah. to, for the end of the quarter. You know, how can, 
how can how can you as a salesperson keep your focus on um, on dropping the rope and 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 actually do it? Yeah, well, the key is is to understand that when you put pressure on the customer, you again you're making someone who's unreceptive, which a high percentage of your people that you're talking to are unreceptive, they become more unreceptive. It just doesn't work. And and what you want to do is the more that you communicate, hey, the, what we offer, I'm not sure what we offer at the beginning of the relationship. If you're right early, early in the stages, you say, hey, I'm not sure, you know, what we offer is a good fit. Our goal, my goal today is to understand what you need, and then we'll step back and look at what's best. And it may not be my solution. You increased your percentage chance of engaging them in a conversation by 22x. 22x. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. Versus, uh, uh, we're going to try to force you. I got you. Let me tell you why you need to talk to me. The more you, the more you, I mean, there's a sign and psychologists have a, have a term for this called reactance principle. In other words, if you try to force somebody, they're going to do the opposite. Like there was a sign. I, I remember reading this sign. Uh, it said, do not throw rocks at this sign. <laughs> and like The sign had holes all in it. It's like, you know, it's just I mean, the people. Well, that I mean, that sign was just asking for it. I mean, we, it was we, just <laughs> asking for it. It's like, but when you when you tell people, hey, this is way, and I've done this for years. When you say, hey, it may not, this may not be. Let's talk. It may maybe this is something you need to do. Maybe it's not. They move towards you, not away from you, because people are rejecting a sales call, not a solution. That's yeah. really important for people to understand. People are rejecting a sales call, not a solution. And so when they're, they're, un, they're emotionally closed, they don't really know what you offer. They're just avoiding you. And the more you act like a seller, the more they want to avoid you. And so you're getting in the way of your message. Yeah. Now, I, what I don't mean is drop the rope and leave. Drop the rope is about to have, how to move into a difficult conversation, how to mm -hmm. open the door um, and it's not about avoiding conflict. Yeah, you know, what's interesting that you know maybe there's a lesson here for people, maybe there's not. But the uh, on our team, we actually I, I like to split things up into different roles, and so yeah. the uh, the sales team um, they take care of a customer until they be until uh, they become a customer. So once someone you know stops right. being a prospect and starts being a customer, mm -hmm. I actually switch them to another team. Who you know doesn't you know the the it was it who can, it can kind of reset the relationship and make sure like you know going forward this person's really just here to help you right like they're right. just your mm -hmm. it's called a customer um, success advocate and right they're just here to be your friend and, and make this easy and like you know respond to your needs yeah and like and what's interesting is a lot you know that team does as much business as the sales team in terms of new business, but it's all like upgrades. It's moving from, you know, someone brought one team of salespeople on with 10 people on it, but they actually have four more teams at their company, right? They just, right. they brought the West region on first and, you know, cause there was some guy on the team that was using it, using our stuff and find it, found it valuable and so that it spreads, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but point being, I guess the, the non-sales team sells as much as the sales team because it's all, it's all upsells and their whole job is just to be helpful, right? They're, yeah. Or, uh, you know, and if, and if, if they kind of get into a salesy type situation, they always can bring in the salesperson again, but like, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, we, we do try to split that out and it's, it's been really interesting the way that's worked. Yeah. It, it, probably the receptivity is, is there because they've already bought the solution, your solution, your service. And now they're working with someone who they feel is not going to try to sell them anything. And so that opens the door. The, the challenge with that is that we've got to balance those two roles. And I think the most effective people do both. They know how to lead the, the customer. They know how to proactively dig for <clears throat> unstated needs or problems because the customer doesn't always know what they need. And so that's the problem with being reactive. If the customer's, if the customer's an expert in your solution and an expert in everything that they need to know about solving their problem, then that you you can just respond to their to their questions or react to their needs or just give them what they want. Yeah. But a lot of most customers aren't, so they need us to lead, but they need to be comfortable with us leading. And so there's this combination of strength and confidence and passion about solving their problem, but creating an environment where they feel comfortable to tell you the truth, 
to, you know, share their, their information about, you know, what, what are their concerns? Because if you, you know, we talk about drop the rope further down the process, you know, we first talked about dropping the rope beginning, like getting a meeting. But even when you're later in the stages of the relationship, when they may say, well, I don't know if it's worth that, you know, maybe, yeah, you're talking to me about upgrades. You know, I don't know if I should upgrade. The answer to that question, we're not, I'm not sure you should either. <laughs> Let's explore together what you're trying to do. Oh, we're trying to sell the company. Well, maybe you don't need to upgrade <laughs> if you're in the process of, <laughs> you know, selling the company or you're merging with somebody else or you don't know. You, then I think what we ought to do is identify what's happening, you know, what's going to happen in the merger or whatever you're doing, and then we'll figure out what's best for you. That puts you in a position of, greater influence people that drop the rope and are what i call other centered and make the customer the hero of the story but know how to lead and are experts in solving the customer's problem they sell more than people that are aggressive traditional sales reps who push things you mentioned just there uh making the customer the hero of the story Mm -hmm. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? I've, I've, I've read some stuff by you talking about how the hero of the story, um, if you make your prospect the hero of the story, it can it can open doors that were otherwise closed to you. Um, yeah. Can you talk about what you mean there and, and what, yeah. how to do that? Yeah, it really, it really is actually pretty simple. Um, you know, one of the questions we said we asked from the customer, you know, we're back to kind of talking about the, the first barrier to receptivity, which is their perception of you. You know, who are you and what are you going to do? And what's your motive? One of the questions they ask, are you going to pressure me? So, you know, the, the way to answer that question is no, and then you drop the rope. The other question they ask is who's the hero of the story? And so if you don't stop before the meeting with the customer and determine who is the hero of the story? Who is the priority? You will always default to self. In other words, you will be the hero of the story, not the customer, because that's just our default. Our, you know, it is. It is just we always are thinking about ourselves. We're in the we're the center of every dream we have. <laughs> There's just we're constantly we default to what we sell, what we do, what we want, what we think. You know, and then we get on the phone with the customer, and then what we try is behavior modification. How do I act like I care about the customer, but get but get get the things done that I want to? And you know, we follow our own agenda. And what we really need to do when we're sitting down to prepare for the meeting, we, you know, we talk about the questions that we ask, and we think about what we're going to say in the meeting. We think about how we're going to introduce ourselves, how we're going to present our solution. We may think about objections and how we're going to respond. Those are all things that are about us. What we need to do is stop and say, who's this about? What's my motive here? Is it is it for me to sell or is it I'm here to serve my customer? Who is the center, the hero of the story? Because motive is ultimately transparent. And the debt, you know, the, the decision you make before the meeting will ultimately determine what happens in the meeting. And so that's the really simplest way is, is, is to really decide what is this meeting about? And, and I make that decision very easily because I've been selling for gosh now. 30 something years is I know I'll be more successful. They're going to tell me the truth. They're going to reveal things that they normally wouldn't reveal. They're going to listen to what I have to say. I'm going to make recommendations that are relevant to them. They're going to agree with whatever I recommend. If I make the decision to put them first, I am just so much more successful versus I don't really know what you need, but I was prepared to say this and here's my billboard and here's what I want to say to you. And this is what they told me to say. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And then they go away and then they, then I have to follow up and I keep trying to sell the same thing and I waste time. But if I say, look, what are you trying to do? And you understand their problem. And then you honestly tell them the best way to solve that problem. Or you say, I can't solve that problem for you. And you fire them as your customer or prospect because you realize you don't, you can't help them. You get rid of people you can't serve, which they're going to, you're not going to help them anyway, or you figure out the best way to serve them and you separate yourself from all the other reps that are just trying to sell stuff. So long answer to your question, but I get passionate about that because people that outsell the, I call it 2X selling, reps that are really other centered and know what they're doing and they lead the customer, outsell the, the, next, the next tier rep 2X. You know, I, I've got a funny story about this mm-hmm. uh, from recently. Um, so the, in, in our space, there's like, um, so we sell to companies that sell to companies 
and there's a there's a very adjacent space where okay the the they sell to companies that sell to consumers and how's the, how this ends up working out in the software is one thing is is making it so you could like walk around a neighborhood and okay. and be optimal as you like you choose which doors to knock on based on their credit right. scores stuff like that you know yeah which, which direction their roof is tilted is it a good roof for solar panels and stuff like they've got all that yeah. they were, wow. they're able to identify that from the from the sky and like you know say like you know is this a good is this a good prospect given their credit mm. score and the angle of their roof should you even bother knocking knocking on right. this door and um and they're able to do all that with technology it's really cool that's that's, cool. that's not us. That's someone else. <laughs> right, right. But yeah. like, but it's you know, still cool. <laughs> very cool and great that they yeah. do that for that kind of sales rep. That's not the kind of sales rep that we help. We help like a field sales rep that's going to sell to a business, so like right. a doctor or a dentist mm -hmm. or a so right. entire entire stores or construction mm -hmm. equipment, or whatever. Voice and yeah. data, voice and data to small businesses. We have several clients that that either use your service or need your service. Yeah, the voice and data is one for us too. So, you know, we, we do that one. And, and, and so it's stuff like that, like business to business and their business to consumer. And and there's there, there's a couple of these companies, so I'm not giving anything away here that's too embarrassing, but it's like, so I'm talking to the CEO of this company, right? Um, and uh, and where, where uh, I, I was like, yeah, I mean, my, I've got my reps trained to just pass pass deals to you if they're like in your space. If yeah. they're like, you know, if they're the kind of people that, you know, they're door to door salesmen that need your stuff, my, my reps are trained not to sell it, not to sell to them. They just pat, re refer them to you and not your competitor because I've heard yours is better. And uh, he's like, really? Why do you do that? I'm like, well, it's a bad customer for me. You're a better fit for them, right? Like you're the one that solves their problems really well. And I mean, I kind of can, but in a bad way. And he's yeah. like, he's like, oh, we. I'm like, do, do you do that? He's like, no, we, <laughs> we try to sell them, sell them on our stuff. And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. You, so in other words, we're not going to, they're not going to send anything my way, but, but you're going to send things his way. <laughs> well, it's, it's still, I think it's still better for me to send stuff his way because it is better. They're going to, they're not a good customer for us. They're going to use our no. stuff for a year, be pissed, leave a bad review and be like, this didn't solve my problems. Mm. And like, and, and they're not going to be a customer for a long time anyway. And they're going to waste a bunch of my team's time trying to, jam this square peg in a round hole so yeah i guess i don't i wasn't like mad at him or anything i was just like well here's why you don't want to do what you're doing you should you should do it the other way because it's better for you and better for the customers so. yeah that that reminds me of a, it's a great story but it, it 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 reminds me of a of a situation i was in early aslan days so i had two things happen kind of back to back now early aslan days that's the name of my company that, that you know our sales training company and we, we launched it. We were in the basement and we were hungry. I mean, this was a lot of risk. We, I have four kids. My partner had two. And so we're, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of bills, a lot of overhead and we're starting this company and we're young. And early on, I had this meeting, great meeting with Turner, like, the, you know, the, the television, the television network. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Perfect, perfect lined up exactly what we, we offer, which was in, at the time inside sales training. That's kind of how we got started in sales training. We had some experience in inside sales training. And you know, my first thing out of her mouth after you know, a couple of pleasantries, she says, uh, do you provide customer service training? <laughs> the simple answer was no. <laughs> but I, because I needed the business, I started trying to make up a customer service program on the spot. <laughs> and it was just, and she could, and this is the thing about it. Motive is transparent. She could tell, you know, there's 43 muscles in our face. She could tell by the way I probably just facially reacted to what she said that I was probably trying to make stuff up based mm -hmm. on how I hesitated and what I said. And I, and she, it was just clear and, and never talked to her again. And what I came to find out later is she didn't want customer service training from us. She was asking for another reason, but I completely blew the relationship because I was trying to make something up. Yeah. So fast forward, I got another situation where I didn't do that. Uh, and again, this was, this was, you know, maybe five years after I started Aslan and I met with a company called APC, big company, big power conversion company, very successful in their space. And they, we were doing work for them and they said, can you provide training for this type of seller that we have and the specific kind of training. I won't bore your listeners with the specifics. And I said, I'm not sure. 
I don't know. And the guy invited me in the meeting when they met with the vendor that provided this kind of training that they were they were going to vet. And they said, why don't you join us for this meeting? Listen to what the guy says. See if you can do that and give us feedback. And I listened to the guy and I said, that guy's better. That's a better solution for what you're trying to do. He has a better solution. You should do that. That's That sounds amazing. And here's why. That was 2003. They are still a client today. I cannot tell you the amount of money. I won't tell you the amount of money they've spent. With <laughs> but, it's the trust, <laughs> but it's a lot because of the trust that we have. I mean, it's, that's what you, you know, so yeah, maybe, maybe this month, this week, I might sell more if I try to manipulate the customer. Yeah. But most likely not. I mean, most likely they're going to go to the internet. They're going to go back to the web and they're going, this is why I don't want to talk to sellers. It so is, it's especially it in the there. modern world, you can't yeah you can't be full of shit in the modern world because mm. there's just too much information. It's too easy for everybody to figure it out. Yeah, like, I don't and, need you. Yeah, lies are lies are transparent. Like it's mm. uh, you know, and that's that's a you know, it's, I, I guess especially for the people list that most listen to this uh, podcast, field sales mm. people, it is so hard to lie in person. It's like, we're just not good at it. Humans, Mm -mm. humans are really bad at it. Like people can tell when you're full of shit, just like you can tell if someone's lying to you You, and you can't even say why you're just like, ah, there's another language. There's something wrong here. I don't, I don't know why, (laughs) but it's such an important lesson is, is, is is you you gotta, you gotta believe in your product and you've got to know why you believe in your product and you've got to, you've got to be a truth teller or, or you get in trouble. And the thing is, it's a competitive advantage. I mean, when you walk in the room and you say, or you make a call or you send an email and say, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is who I help. This is who I don't help. And I'm not sure who you are. Here's what I'd like to do. Or when you're at the later in the stage and they're maybe giving you objections, they say, I'm not sure I need to pay this much money for this. This sounds expensive. And I say, you know what? It may not be. Let's look at this. Let's take a deeper dive. Maybe there's something I missed. Maybe you shouldn't pay Maybe we can change our solution. Maybe we can't. Let's the focus of this is what we teach is like the best way to overcome an objection is to tell the truth. Yeah. Like it, and most people don't know the truth. What's the truth? Should they pay more? Should they should, you know, maybe you don't offer a global solution. Maybe, maybe they need a global solution. Maybe they don't. Maybe they need a service contract. Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't. And I think most people in sales, I shouldn't say most, because I, I think just my experience has been we we probably lean too much on what the company tells us to say versus the top sellers figure it out. They get to know their customer. They know what's on their customer's whiteboard. That's a big part of, of, of driving receptivity. If you know what's on the customer's whiteboard and you mm-hmm. go, I know you're in this role. And b- because you're in this role, you probably have these four or five things on your whiteboard. And these are the typical problems you have. And these are the typical objectives you have. And this is how you get a bonus. And this is what you read. And this is what you look at. And this is what you care about. And you know that. And you become an expert at that. You're, you're, you're extremely valuable and very different than everybody else who just memorizes their script, says it over and over again, has the pain PowerPoint pitch, and just does their thing. And they're running around, throwing messages out there, and there's less and less people who are listening. You know, I, I, I learned this, uh, this lesson literally. I, you know, I know it's a figurative whiteboard, but I, I learned it literally early in my sales career. I was yeah. in training. I, I was in IBM sales training school. And yeah. uh, it's like a year long program teaching people wow. how to sell technology. And, uh, and I, and, and you do it your first year, you're in there, you're working for them in sales. And for one of the, like, they have these exams. So you're, you're actually pitching and having fake sales meetings with like retired, you know, old guys from IBM yeah. that are like, you know, in their sixties and have retired mm-hmm. recently, but they, they kind of, they, yeah. they, they, old salesmen never die. They just keep, they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they, keep, they keep going. <laughs> and, and so, uh, they can't so, die. They won't die. They won't. They don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some, some of these guys seem like they were in their mid eighties, but they, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just kind of they they were still yeah. trainers. They would come and you right. know hang out one day a week. Sure, you weren't talking to a computer. Yeah, pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but but the, for the, for one of these meetings, I you know I we go in there and we're doing our sales pitch, and uh, and then after the after the thing is over, after like the whole situation's over, the the guy points at the whiteboard next to him and like all this important, like, you know, walking into this like little room, I just assumed it was like old scribbles from like, you know, another meeting that had happened in there, but it was like 
key pieces of information about the sales call that I just didn't didn't re- didn't look at it, didn't read it, didn't bring it up. And so it's a, it was a literal learning of your lesson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is a whiteboard. Yeah, well, that you know, that's one of the things we talk about in getting meetings. You know, most people, when they think about, okay, how do I get a meeting, right? Because when we talk about people that are emotionally closed, right, they're either the doors closed or the subject closed, you know? So, and if you're, you know, you feel it very, you know, you feel it very, um, you know, it's very in your face when you're trying to get a meeting because people are clearly have a closed door and it's most, you know, the success rate is like less than 2%. Um, but if you want to get an open door, the best way to do that is to lead with what's on their whiteboard. If you start a sentence with because you, you will always get their attention. If you can lead with, okay, because you are, if and the way I say that is if I show you a picture of you or I show a picture and you're in it, you will look at it 100% of the time. And so sales reps typically lead with their solution. It's what they know. Let me tell you, let me tell you, we have a solution that does this. And we've tested this. You lead with something about them. They will read it 100% of the time. So it's really, that's part of why reps that are successful, these two X reps, I call them, um, because they're other centered, they know how to lead conversations and how to draw people in by talking about what's on their whiteboard. And, and how would you recommend people, uh, a sales rep, learn what's on their prospect's whiteboard? I mean, not, not all of them have the great experience I did, yeah. of walking into the room and it literally what I needed was written on the on Yeah, the you had it on there. <laughs> well, there's two ways. One is you can talk to people in the organization that know, right? Especially if it's more of a strategic opportunity and you feel like it's worth that investment. Um, you can you can just ask people, hey, listen, I'm trying to get a, a, a meeting with Susan. And, you know, can you be my coach and help me prepare for that meeting or try to find somebody to do that? Um, especially your, your outside sales, you're wandering around. You can try to get that information from the people that you meet with prior to getting to the decision maker. But the other way is when you do have meetings with decision makers or other people who, who've had meetings with decision makers, you ask. You become a student of the people you serve. And every time you have a meeting, you say, what are the top five things you're working on? Regardless of what I sell. What is it, you know, at the end of the year, you will be successful if, if what happens, what's your biggest pain point? Again, because what people will talk about is what you're there to talk about. Like if you have a certain solution, a certain software, certain service, the conversation's about that. But if you say, well, let's, let's, let's step that aside. Like what, what is, what are you doing? What's, what's your whole year route about? What are you trying to accomplish? And if you just spend a little bit of time doing that with customers for the next three months, you're going to have so much intelligence that will serve you so well in the future. And so that's, so that's two ways. Either what, you know, talk to them about, talk to the people you meet with and find that out, do your own research so that you can predict or you can talk to some, an insider. Fantastic advice. I bet, I bet there are a few sales meetings that wouldn't go better if, at some point in the first five minutes, you you work some version of that question into the conversation. What what are the, what's most important to you right now? What are you working on right now? What are the top five things? Whatever, however you want to say it, like that it almost belongs in every sales conversation. Because yes, if if you are because they took the meeting with you, right? You know that something about you is going to come up, and it's great to hear in their words what what it is. Yeah, what is. And I, I think my mental image for whiteboard is just a bridge. They have a current state and they have a desired future state. There's something that everybody wants, and that's the desired future state. Whatever level you are in the organization, there's a desired future. So that's where they want to go. That's where the bridge is going. And then they've got a plan to get there. And then there's part of that plan that's, that's unknown to them, that scares them. That's it. And if I know what that is and where I fit in that overall scheme of things, that bridge, and what I'm helping them get to, then I'm going to be smarter and smarter and smarter. And the, the cool thing is, is if I'm talking to one decision maker, one VP, and I'm talking to 30 or 40 other VPs in the next, you know, three or four or five months, now I have information about the market that, that, that every VP doesn't have. They don't get to talk to all those VPs, right? So I talk to VPs of sales. I talk to VPs of learners, VPs of sales enablement. So I might talk to 50 in a year. They may talk to one or two or three. 
And so if I become a student of that, I can share best practices of what I'm learning. And of course, nothing that would be considered competitive or confidential information, but, um, and there's the top percentage, the top 1% that do that. Yeah. Well, I, I love to use the example. Um, if you sell the dentists, don't, if you sell, you know, tooth whitening lasers to dentists, yeah, don't just yeah. know all about their tooth whitening laser problems and that part of their business. You should know about how dentist offices deal with parking problems because you know, like everything going on in their business, you want to know, you want to understand what's HIPAA because, done to their business. What, how are they going to sell their business? Where are they in the transition? Exactly. Who, what's happening with the partners? What do they, what do they want to grow? They want to shrink. They want to, I mean, all yes. that stuff. Because if you, you can, you talk to, you know, 50 dentists every month, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they get, they have their three buddies that they keep in touch with from, uh, from dental school. That's about yeah. it. Right. So I, you can become a, you can, you can know way more about certain elements of your customer's business than they can know because they only get to do it once you get to talk to lots of people that do it. And so if you get mm -hmm. that expertise in their business and you, and this is especially if you sell like a vertical solution, like I always sell to this type of person right. in this industry that you can, it gets a re, it can be a real, real powerful um, weapon for a salesperson to have that expertise. Yeah. It's, 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 it's what the other, so I talk about captivate, you know, if we're really going to be great at or delivering a message. The first step is captivate. You know, we've got to captivate their attention by talking about them, beginning the sentence with because you, the next thing we need to do is elevate. We need to elevate ourselves from a seller to somebody they need to follow. Because if, if the reason that real decision makers don't meet with sales reps is because they have nothing to say. Right. You know, you, you talk to the reps, they, they delegate it down to an evaluator that says, go out and see what the vendors offer and see what the pricing is and bring me your, they don't want to meet with the sales reps because the sales reps don't have anything to say. So we need to elevate our position by telling them something unknown about a better way to solve their problem. And we get that information by studying all the people we meet with. You know, I mean, think about the, you know, if you can do small businesses and I've worked with, you know, I remember working with Sharp. And so all the reps were working with small business owners who were reselling their, you know, their service, their, their, I guess their equipment and service. And so they're meeting all these small, there's all over the country. They're working with these small business imaging, you know, VARs. And they had just so much information they could share to Bob in New York, who's saying, yeah, I'm going to try to sell my business in probably about five years. That's my exit strategy. And if you start to have those conversations, you start to see things and they, and they'll talk to you about stuff like that. If they believe that you, that you care and you're interested, um, and it's going to benefit them, they'll start to share. Yeah. And you can learn from, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to be an expert in, you know, parking lot strategies, no. but, but a lot of dentist offices are, you know, in these buildings that don't have enough parking and like, you know, you, you talk to right. enough of them. You know, you talk to five of them about their problem, how they approached it, how they solved it, whether it's a problem anymore. You know, now you're now you know a little bit. You talk to ten of yeah. them, you know a fair amount. You talk to twenty, now you know a ton. You're arguably an expert in the space of dental office parking, right? Yeah. And, and now you got something to talk to all these guys about, even though yeah. you sell a tooth whitening laser. Like it's it's uh it, it's it's a powerful strategy. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's it works. It works. And, 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 you know, the whole, the old days of here's the features and benefits of what I offer. People are like, oh, Hey, I can figure that out. I can figure that out online. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're also so overwhelmed. They're not willing to talk to you about uh, other things that you might offer beyond, I don't know what you call the dental whitening. Um, what did you call that? I'm not exactly sure the example. De dental whitening laser. I'm just using an example. Yeah, laser, dental whitening laser. I don't want to talk. I've already made the decision about that, and I don't want to talk to you about that. So I'm I'm closed, and, and so the subject closed. And they're not willing to have deeper conversations because it just they don't trust you. Yeah. Well, it, it can be you know you, you can you can make you, if you once you become the parking lot expert for dentists. You can publish a paper about it, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, just, you can have, you can have it on a blog. You can go on podcasts that dentists listen to and talk about it. Right. Like right. there's, 
it, it's it's a powerful strategy. Yeah. And one other thing you said, um, you know, to influence a buyer, you really you have to know where they stand, where they're coming from, right? Mm-hmm. How do you get them to share truth with you? We've talked about how you need to be truthful to them, but how yeah. do you how do you kind of elicit what where their heads at? Okay. How, yeah. how do you get them to tell you that? That's a great that's a great question. I think this has more to do with driving receptivity than anything else we do. A lot of people think it's about how well we share our point of view and our position and our, you know, value prop. It's actually how well we validate their point of view. So the, 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 the mental image I give people when we talk about or answer, when I answer this question is that think about your, your, you have two polarized points of view. So you're on the North pole and the, the person that you're meeting with is on the South pole. So you have, to, you see one way is up and they have a completely polarized point of view. That's a picture of influence, right? You have one point of view, oh, they should invest in this product solution. They're like, I don't know, I'm fine. I got, I'm fine. Are, are you, we need to meet. And they're like, I don't, I don't want to meet. Um, but you have two polarized points of view. And so what we want to do is what we call take the trip, leave our position, come down there and learn what their point of view is until we can feed it back to them and communicate that we understand it as well or better than they do until they say exactly. And so that becomes that first, that needs to be the goal. The goal is, is we got to leave our position, not try to disagree with them. Like their position, they see the world one way, we see the world differently. I've got to leave my position, take the trip, regardless of what it is until I can feed it back to them. And they say exactly. And the key to that is you got to learn how to add really first, you got to let go of your position. You've got to be willing to see that there's a reason that they believe what they believe. And so, and if you take the trip, leave your position, you're going to have what you, what I call an O moment. Like there's a reason people wear their mask in the car, right? I don't know what that is. I've never talked to them. But <laughs> I, I, but I want to ask. I've and actually I get, done it. I've done it before, but that's because I forgot that it was on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be, but you know, like I saw, I saw somebody the other day, and um, they got out of their house. They walked out of their house of walking. They walked out of their house, got in their car, put their mask on, and got out of trouble. And I said, so when you see people that have a different point of view than you, because I'm like, I don't think you need to wear a mask by yourself in your car. That's my position. I've heard you can catch COVID from the radio. I've heard that. Yeah, maybe, maybe that is it. I don't know. My, my instinct is to say, you're wrong. You don't need to do that. That's my instinct. But the reality is there's a reason that they're doing what they're doing. And if I don't, what I call take the trip and respect their point of view, and they tell me I'm going to have a, what I call the O oh moment. Oh, that's why you do that. And whatever reason they have, there's a reason. And then I need to feed that back to them. I, kind of sticking with the COVID theme, my wife has not been vaccinated. And so she went to her doctor, a different doctor. And uh, my wife has chronic immune, like an immune disease. Um, it's like, a, it's a, what am I trying to, autoimmune disease. That's what I couldn't quite remember it. She has an autoimmune disease. And so she's worried about, take getting the vaccine because of some of those complications and some other medicine Mm -hmm. that she's on. Well, the doctor just basically at the end of the said, are you vaccinated? And she said, no. And then, so she, the doctor took her to court, gave her the, you know, 15 minutes of here's why you need to be vaccinated, felt good about it. And my wife left. Well, what happened? Nothing. Right. All right. She needed to say, look, I need to validate why there's a reason. Let me understand that. Let me feed it back to you. And the doctor, if the doctor would have said, oh, so that's what's going on, then she could have communicated back to my wife, given that that's the situation, here's why you still may want to consider it, or I don't know what they would say. But that mental picture of leaving your position and taking the trip is really critical. And then you have to have, you have to, there's a what and a how to do that. There's what you need to focus on to be able to take the trip. You need a roadmap and you need to know how to drive. You need some new skills to do that. But that's, the critical issue is to first understand that you've got to take the trip. 
Well, that next time you, uh, when everyone goes home for, uh, for, for Thanksgiving this year, now that they can use this, this new skill on their, on their crazy <laughs> uncle too, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> truly understand yeah. his position before, <laughs> before you yeah. stomp out of the room and just grab it, grab your seventh eggnog, you know? <laughs> but what happens too, is when you take that position, when you say, okay, so you have your, you have a different political position. You have a different view of a solution. You have a different stance on this. And that seems, that doesn't make sense to me. But you say, you know what? I'm going to drop the rope. I'm not going to try to pull you to my position. I want to understand. And I'm going to ask some great questions. I want to understand. And I'm going to respect that you have different. I want to understand that. And you get curious. And you continue to take the trip until you have that oh moment. You, people start telling you some stuff that's really valuable. They start to tell you the informal things. They start to they start to lean in and they say, well, we haven't told anybody this, but we really don't have the money to do this, but we're not sure. We need to talk to Bob because if we don't get the Bob, it's not going to happen. Or we said well, this is why we want to buy it, but actually it's really because of this guy or this woman has says this, this, and this, and they're really the drivers. Or They tell you the informal stuff, they, and they also tell you their biases. Well, the real reason we never bought this is because you guys screwed up 10 years ago, and so we've just decided never to work with you. Again. Now, even though you sold, you know, you're not the same company and you completely solved that problem, you want them to tell you all that stuff. And when they do, you have an opportunity to respond. And not only do you have the information, you have something, some, you have a situation where they're going to actually listen to you. You've built a foundation to be heard. You've earned the right to be heard by listening to them first. And it, it, there's a, it completely changes the temperature in the room when you just set aside your agenda and you go, okay, let's go. Let me tell me about what you think. And you, you, you move from being a salesperson to being a journalist. The curiosity, you use the word curiosity. I think that's mm -hmm. key here. Yeah. Play, what play, most people play, do a with, play a game with in your own mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you see what happens when we role play this, when I role play this with, with, with sellers, especially senior sellers, it's actually harder for people that have been in the business longer because they have the answer to all the questions. They've heard mm -hmm. it all before and they're smart. And so as soon as a customer says, well, the reason is blah, 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 blah. They're like, well, let me tell you why you're wrong. It's like yeah. they're in court and they ask a question and that gives them the opportunity to share the answer. But see, there's much something much more important going on. There's a, you know, we're trying to create a fertile soil so we can plant the seed. Because if the soil's not fertile, the seed, our message doesn't matter. And everybody's so much more interested in the seed, which is the message. But we got to get them to say, ultimately, we want them to say to us, what do you think I should do? And if we can get them to say, what do you think I should do? Then you can deliver the message. And that's when people change their beliefs. It's when they change their biases. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And um, yeah, you, you advocate using something that you call word pictures yeah so and the, and the goal there is to move a buyer emotionally to a new point of view or take a new perspective yeah. can you can you talk about what a word picture is and how reps can use it yeah word pictures i think is is it's an advanced skill but it is one of the most effective and efficient ways to build value so we talk about, um, or here's the truth about changing beliefs that we, we teach a formula, action equals belief plus care. So ABC, action equals belief plus care. For people to take action and change their behavior, dramatically change their behavior, change their beliefs, they have to not only believe that they need to change, but they have to really care. They have to emotionally experience the benefit. Like if you think about a retirement, like over 90 plus percentage of people would say, yeah, I need to save for retirement. I logically know I need to save for retirement. But the reality is only 50% of the people actually save for retirement. So even though they know they both, they don't know what it feels like to be broke in 70. And until you know what it feels like to, to, to be broke in 75, you're not going to save for retirement. And some people know that at 15 years old, and some people know that at 50, and some people know that at 70. It, so but until they emotionally experience it. So the goal is not only logically deliver <coughs> our recommendation, here are the logical reasons why, but we also need to get them to emotionally experience it. So that's where word pictures come in. If you can use a word picture, which basically is taking something that they know, like they emotionally understand the benefit of something and connecting that with something they don't know. 
So, and so you use an analogy to be able to connect something that they understand with something they don't understand. And I, I can give you an example. Um, I was working with Aflac and, um, you know, they, they, they sell insurance and to small businesses and it's benefits. And so one of the questions early on was, well, do you understand our business? Right. You know, how much, how much work have you done in our space? You know, the belief being you need to understand our industry if you're going to be able to help us. And we didn't have a ton of experience. And so here was a word picture that, that we shared with the head of, of, of learning at the time, um, who was also a big baseball fan, coached baseball and loved the Houston Astros. And so <laughs> I said, do you remember what did what did Sports Illustrated say? about Houston, the Houston Astros in 2014, when they were on the cover of Sports Illustrated in 2014, what did, what did it say? And the guy said, well, that because he loved baseball and he loved the Houston Astros. He said, they were going to win the World Series in 2017. And I said, exactly. And I said, and what happened in 2017? He goes, they won the World Series. And I said, why? And he goes, because they brought somebody outside of baseball who under looked at baseball in a different lens and provided a different way to think about how recruiting a team or putting a team together than anybody had thought about in the industry. And I said, exactly. I said, and we're not from the industry. So we have a different lens. So it was a, it was a really easy way to connect what happened with Houston with what we potentially could bring to him uh, from being outside of the industry. And so that's just an example of, of, you know, how you can develop some kind of analogy to where something difficult for people to grasp but then some you can you can make it very easy for them to understand it takes work and it needs to be relevant to the people you're talking to but it's very effective yeah that, that oh, oh i i, I kind of felt like every uh, company should try to come up with a few good word pictures that everyone can yeah. use because those that those are hard to come up with on the spot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you, you do need to prepare for them. So you have, and that's what we talk about when we develop word pictures. So think about some of the, you know, the handful of, of solutions that you have or uh, things about your solution that are difficult for them to understand or um, something that's challenging to communicate, but you, you don't have a lot of time to communicate it. You know, sometimes some of these, some of these questions that they have are concerns. It might take 30 minutes to really address it. Like, why do I need to pay more? Why is it really worth it? And, you know, it might take a while to be able to communicate that. So if you can come up with a word picture, which again, you can prepare for that, you may come up with a very effective way to do that. Like one of the things we say in our industry, uh, or we talk about at our company is, is, you know, people will say, well, just send us the information on your training program. You know, what, what, what you know, just send us the information. I say, and I'll say something like, you know, if, if I just send you the information on our program, it's going to look like every other program that you're going to see. It's like a menu to a, a, a restaurant. If I show you a menu at a restaurant, they're all going to say pretty much the same thing. There's going to be meat, seafood, and appetizers, and desserts. And it's going to be kind of, and I, I could write a really cool menu, but what's the best way for you to see the difference between the restaurants? And they always say, you got to taste the food. I say the best way for you to see what programs we offer and really understand the value of our program is you need to see it. You got to see it to understand what we offer. Because if I just send you an over brochure of the car, you're not going to really understand the car. You need to see the car. So, so those are just simple examples of word pictures that that's something that everybody can use. The menu example is a word picture that like a lot of our you know, people, in our organization use. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be the creative one. Like you, you can, if somebody develops it, you can use it over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's. Uh, I was thinking every organization should sit down and think of a few of these really great analogies because they. It, it's one thing I've always, in my sales career, I've always loved hanging hanging out with the the people who've been selling this stuff for fifteen years because they'll just right. They'll, they'll say they'll use word they'll use patterns in their words or use things like uh what what you're what you're calling a word picture here. That I'm just and I'm just like I will be taking that. That is brilliant. <laughs> right yeah, now, right. Yeah, once you down. come up with it, <laughs> once you come up with it, um, yeah. I mean, you can, and I, I. You really. That's where I spend a lot of my time in prepping. If I'm walking into a, you know, an important presentation, is is preparing 
those word pictures from a, some of those key moments that could that could surface where they ask the tough questions. You know, like you know, a tough question that we get sometimes is, you know, hey, uh, if you know, what's your global? This is early on. What's your global capabilities? You know, like, well, if we don't have a lot of, if, if, you know, do you have the program translated or do you have some of those questions that we get? And so, well, we, we customize a lot of our content. So we're customizing. We can't, we can't have it in all these different languages because it always changes. And so how, how do I explain that to people simply? What does that mean? What's the power of customization? Um, so you have to develop language and word pictures and truth around that. Because it's another thing that we talk about when you're building value is sharing disruptive truths. And so when you say, look, most people think this is true, but actually this is what's true. And the more you disruptive truth you can share, the more they lean in and say, oh, you know something that I don't know. There's a reason that I need to listen to you. And so it's a way of, again, you elevating who you are and sharing with them things that they don't know about a better way to solve their problem. And this goes well beyond kind of the features and benefits that most people share. Absolutely. Well, that, that makes a ton of sense. The, the next section is sales in 60 seconds, quick questions okay. and quick answers. So right, first, quick, <laughs> first, first question, what are the biggest mistakes salespeople make when dealing with unrespe unreceptive prospects? I think it's talking too early. I think, I think being comfortable with taking the trip and saying, I, I'm not sure what you need. Let me understand more. And when they hear good information, they, they want to jump on it. Or when they hear bad information, they want to jump on it. So instead of responding quickly, saying, what do you mean by that? Diving in, making them comfortable sharing you the truth, making them comfortable sharing bad information. There's no wrong answers. So when customers says, well, our customers do this and our, our, your competitor does this and we like this better and going, okay, okay. So maybe it makes sense for you to work with your competitor. Tell me about that. So not overcoming that and making them comfortable, completely sharing the truth. <clears throat> and um, what would you say the best way is for a salesperson to practice building receptivity with their buyers? the best way to practice that i would say kind of going back to uh the to say, the example i said to uh, i shared before is spend a day where you only ask questions and you can't respond to what they say <laughs> it's a fun exercise yeah use, in other words you, you, you could just, use that one at home too yeah and use that <laughs> at home like just just put yourself in a situation where you're not the center of attention and you make the, 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 you make whoever's talking the hero of the story and you just, and look at how, what you learn, how they respond to you, how the relationships develops, or it also may expose your inability to keep the conversation going because you have to be talking to have a conversation. Listening training. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had to name one critical skill or trait that a salesperson needs today, what would it be and why? I would say leading. Of a lot of sellers are missing the expertise to lead, the expertise to lead. So what's, what is the process? What's the best process, not to sell your solution, but what is the best process for the customer to determine what's the solution? What's the best solution for them? They have a problem. They need to figure out a solution. What solution do, that would be best for them? And then articulate, identify that or, and learn how to articulate that. And then how do they gain a leadership position and, and walk them through it versus letting the customer come up and define that and develop it and define that and following them. And um, what would you say the greatest sales lesson is that you've learned over the years? is that you're most successful when you serve. It's, it's kind of, it even sounds a little cliche and sounds like, okay, whatever. But people that really are focused on helping the customer solve their problems and becoming a student of their customer are truly other-centered. 
but at the same time lead. They're not just relationship managers. They actually are, they, they're trusted partners who lead the customer. They challenge the customer when they're going to make bad decisions. They challenge the customer when they're not sure that, you know, when the customer's saying, I think we should do this. And they have tough conversations, but um, they really ultimately are just trying to help the customer solve their problem. I'm not sure uh, what order we're releasing these in, but uh, we just, I think, I think it was the last podcast I did uh, in, in real time order was, yeah, uh, was with right. the, the author of the book uh, that uh, about service oriented sales. So they, yeah. they would, they would agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think salespeople should do every day to become more so more successful? I think it would be, Every day, what does they do every day to become more successful? I would say learn, kind of go back to our conversation, continue to learn what's on the decision makers. Whether you serve a certain type of profile of, of decision makers and become a student and learn more and more every day about what's on not only their whiteboard, but what's, what is your competitors doing? Become a student of your competition. What are options that the decision makers have and study them? And so, you know, what are the best practices? How, how have they have other people solve the problem that your decision makers are facing? What is the competitors offering? And the more that you can make sense of this complicated world, the more valuable you would be. And I would say, so your, your knowledge bank should continue to go to continue to increase. Um, as an actionable takeaway what should salespeople listen to today do as a first step towards building receptivity in their buyers i think dropping the rope is the easiest thing to do is just start dropping the rope again don't throw the rope and walk away but start having when you sense there's any receptivity challenges whether you're in the beginning of the process or you're down the road is just learning to say things like i'm not sure if this is right for you let's have a conversation to determine if. Um, so dropping the rope. And the other thing that I would say is, this probably should be something I said in some of your other questions, is seek feedback. We all have blind spots. The, the, the way that I talk about it, we all have a sign above our head and we can't see it. But everybody else that works with us or we sell to can see it. And so these are our blind spots. And just meet with some trusted people and seek some honest feedback about how you may be inhibiting receptivity and, and being effective at being a trusted partner and, a, and a, to effective at influence and see where, see what they say. And if one person says it and, and five other people don't say that, ignore it. But if you start to, you know, you five or six people start telling you the same thing, that's where you need to go to work. Yeah. I mean, honestly, getting like 360 feedback from people in your life mm -hmm. that you work with that are your customers, the more you can elicit feedback and see patterns. Uh, it's so powerful that, that yeah. we, that's a, uh, that's one of my big lessons in life is, is uh, other people have a lot of the answers. If you just uh, take the time to ask, ask them for the answers and listen to their answers. Yeah. Yeah. The, the answer is out there. If you seek it. Yeah. yeah. It is. That is a very, um, a very underutilized strategy is to just just seek feedback like either watch your watch your videos zoom see what you do see what you say get feedback from other people that you trust and you very quickly you will you will get better all right so i'm going to try to summarize what tom has gone over today for us and taught us so first of all Sellers are partially responsible for buyers being unreceptive. Customers are overwhelmed by the increase of information in the world. It's very noisy out there. Buyers are looking to salespeople to find out something new. There are many barriers to receptivity, and the first barrier is the customer's perception of the salesperson. One thing one strategy salespeople can use is the drop the rope strategy. And um, that's that can using that strategy can lift the pressure that the customer is under. Lifting the pressure um, can then make the customer more receptive. People are rejecting sales calls that are not solutions. And Salespeople need to think of the customer as the hero of the story. 
salespeople will be more successful if they make the decision to put the customer first. You can you always have to be upfront with buyers. Stretching the truth will always break trust. Lead your sales conversations with something about your prospect and not about your solution. Learn more about potential buyers from other contacts in the company and also ask prospects directly what their main goals or pain points are. Elevate your position as a seller by telling buyers something they want to know about their business that they didn't already know. Become someone that buyers want to follow by becoming an expert in their space, even if it's only at a few things. Salespeople can work to change a buyer's strongly held beliefs by taking the trip. So that means leave your own position and work to understand the buyer's position as much, uh, as, much as you can. So you want to you know it and be able to say it like they do. You can also drop the rope like we've talked about and, and you can ask questions so that you understand all the complexities of their viewpoint. You can then say their viewpoint back to them and get them to say exactly. This process helps people change their biases and become more receptive. Well, this has been so educational for people and so helpful. I, I, I truly believe that. Uh, where, where can our listeners read more about your work, reach out to you, get to know you better? Uh, I would love that. Um, you know, if you're interested in training, that's the Aslan Training is the name of our company. So how, do you, Aslan, how do you spell that? Aslan is A-S-L-A-N training.com. If you're just interested in the book, that's there's a book website called unreceptivebook.com. And that'll provide some videos about the book, more information about the book. Um, I think we're, we're offering now the first two chapters um, to people who want to sort of check out the book before buying it. Uh, if we're not, we're, that's, that will be offered soon. Um, and then, of course, on LinkedIn, I'd love for, to connect with people on LinkedIn. And, and Tom Stanfill, you can just look at, look me up under Tom Stanfill, S-T-A-N-F-I-L-L -L is the name. And um, would love to connect with you there. So that's three options for you if you would like to learn more. Very cool. Well, you know, th this has been a, uh, a fantastic episode of the outside sales talk and if you work in field sales you'll love badge maps number one route planner that helps you sell 20 percent more and drive 20 percent less you can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today and that's my commercial <laughs> um, great commercial if, if you can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from learning the the skills that we talked about today definitely uh share the love and forward this on to them but uh take care until next time everybody and uh Tom, I really appreciate you coming on on the show and, and teaching us all these things. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Loved your show. Loved your questions. One of the best podcasts I've been on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Take care.